Let us get back to some golfing matters. And the golfing year, for all intents and purposes, is done and dusted. And one man who I'm sure will be rejoicing and relishing in the break because he's back home here in New Zealand is our own Ryan Fox, who's not only hit an awful lot of golf balls in 2022, but has hopped off and on a lot of planes. Um, But it's been well worth it. He has seen his world ranking climb from a, a distant figure up inside the top 50. And in golf, that's everything. Once you have an official ranking inside the top 50, doors, as they say, start to open. And I think Ryan, and he's joining me now, will be able to clarify this, but I think most of the doors for the four majors will open to him, or maybe he's got some extra work to do. He's had a very successful year. He's won twice on the DP Tour, which is the old European Tour, and he's certainly going to be playing quite a bit of golf in America next year by the sound of it, and he joins me now back here in Auckland after a very long and successful year. Ryan, a very good afternoon to you. Afternoon, Telf. So just clarify for me, first of all, where you stand now in terms of your world ranking. How many majors next year are you guaranteed an entry to at the moment? Um, at the moment, I, I mean, it's, it'll be the... Ma- I don't have the invites yet, but they take the Masters take the top 50 at the end of the year, um, which I obviously can't drop out of now. So there's one. Um, and from my older merit finish, I will get the Open for next year too. Um and for memory, the US PGA is a, it takes the top hundred in the world a couple of weeks before um, entries close, and the US Open takes the top sixty um, when entries close. So yeah, no guarantees as yet for either of them, but um, yeah, probably more than likely if I play half decent at the start of next year that I'll be in both of those as well. So it'd be safe to say that you still have some work to do to to get a start and maybe two of them. Yeah, I'd say probably I for the PGA, I will stay inside the top 100 by May, regardless, I think, of how I play. Um, the US Open, I think, in June. Line, so, huh? Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, we're just, uh, I'm just thinking whether I might just get you to move a, a wee bit because the line is just a little bit smudgy from where you're coming from. Okay. No problem. I don't, I, don't um, want, yeah, so I, don't, I don't want to disturb the sleep of your little one by getting you to get too close to their their room. But, uh, yeah, if it's just the way it is, I suppose. The spot we've got here does seem to interfere with some of the telephone, cell phone reception lines. But, anyway, I think we've got you. Okay, so you, um, you, I guess the one that you want to play in above all else, and I know years ago you were telling me this in your earlier days as a professional, that the great goal that you had and the great dream that you had of playing the Masters one day, now it's about to unfold, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's, I'm excited about that for next year. Um, you know, that's one I've been wanting to take off since, you know, before I turned pro, and um, it's always probably the hardest one to, to take off being in the top 50, is, um, you know, re- requires some pretty good golf, and you know, it took a, took a year's worth of, of good golf to get to where I am, and um, yeah, you know, very excited about getting that invite in the mail whenever that happens um, over Christmas. So it's a very difficult course, Augusta, isn't it? It's, it's not necessarily the longest course that you play in the course of the year, but it's got its sort of particular eccentric sort of features. And often it's said that you can't expect to set the world on fire in your first appearance at Augusta. So you'll get there, what, a week beforehand? You'll have a couple of practice rounds beforehand, which will certainly help. But, I mean, how high would your expectations be with your first Augusta appearance? Um, I mean, I'd, first of all, I think I'll try to do... I, I think you can do a trip there, um, you know, prior to the Masters. So I'll try to get a couple of rounds in with one of the local caddies and, and try to get some insight on the golf course, you know, before the Masters week. So hopefully that'll help. Um, and try to pick Steve Williams' brain a little bit as well. Obviously, he's got a pretty good track record around there. Um, but... Yeah, I don't think the expectations are super high. I mean, it is what you, know, you hear. I think there's only been one first-time winner of Augusta in, in its history. Or, sorry, someone who won it first time playing. Um, so, it's yeah, I think it's a hard course to figure out. And um, you know, hopefully I get a few more chances. But, um, yeah, there'll be no expectations to going there this year. Obviously, I, w- I want to play well and, um, you know, try not to do anything different than what I've done this year. I've just tried to go out and beat any golf course that I've played. And... Um, thankfully, I probably did that more often than not. And Augusta might be one of those golf courses that might be a little bit hard to figure out and a little bit hard to beat first up. But, um, yeah, looking forward to that challenge. Uh, Augusta, because it's got a smaller field, it doesn't have 144 or 156. I think it's usually somewhere between 90 and 100. I think the 
the cut is usually the top 44. I mean, would that be that would be a more realistic goal, though, wouldn't it? Ah, uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, you go into every event wanting to do as well as you can, and I've not been one to be honest that set goals in that. You know, to go, I will, I just want to make the cut, or I want to finish top ten. Um, you know, sort of set the big the big goals at the start of the year, whether it's going to win or get in the top fifty or do whatever. And then, um, you know, every week I just try to do the same thing. It's try to go out and beat the golf course and be in contention come Sunday afternoon. And anything kind of happened from there. I, I found I didn't really get a whole lot of benefit from from those other little goals, like you know, just trying to make the cut or something like that. So. Yes, while that will be definitely the goal, I think, you know, in general, just go out and, and play as well as I can. And I know if I play well, I can compete with the top players in the world around any golf course. Imagine you must be looking forward to the Open this year because it's a very special one, isn't it? It's the hundred and, is it the 150th year? No, I, that was this year. Oh, this year. I got to experience that and it's a... It's at my manager's home course, actually, next year at Hoylake, which he's pretty excited about. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to looking forward to getting there and, and seeing what that's going to be like. It's uh, yeah. apparently quite a good golf course, although apparently it's about a foot deep in snow at the moment. Have you played it? No, I haven't. I've played a few up that way, but not Hoylake. And, um, yeah, it's, it's apparently one of those quite tight, tricky courses, a lot of out-of-bounds everywhere, sort of one of those quirky open style courses that you probably wouldn't design now but um you know it's got plenty of history and, and it's quite quite difficult to play at times as far as the dp world tour goes i guess now you're in this good space where you've played most of these courses now two or three times and you've enjoyed uh, success at quite a few of them with top 10 finishes and a couple of wins so does it make it a bit easier for you now when you're on that tour uh Yes and no. I mean, you know, you've obviously got your expectations that you want to contend every week, um, and that might, probably makes it a little hard. But um, you know, compared to say next year, where I'll be playing a lot in the states, and if, you know, all the golf courses will be new, it's certainly easier going back to venues that you that you know, and you can actually pick a schedule as well on venues that you've you know you know you really enjoy playing. And, you know, that helps um, when you turn up to a venue you like. But, you know, vice versa, it kind of goes the other way. So, say, Wentworth, for me, Wentworth's a golf course that I've always struggled with a little bit for some reason or another. And, you know, you get golf courses that don't seat your eye. And, obviously, Wentworth's sort of the biggest tournament on our tour. And you go back there every year and you go, well, how am I going to try to figure out how to play it this year? Because I haven't figured it out yet. Um, so, it does kind of go both ways with, with knowing the golf courses. Okay, when you look at your performances this year and the success that you've had, the consistency you've been able to achieve, what are the factors? Is there any one or two factors that you've improved noticeably on this year that have enabled you to be more competitive? Um, I mean, my putting's improved a lot this year. You can see that statistically. Um, And to be honest, I don't really... I can't put that down to anything per se. Um, You know, whether that's just a mentality thing being more comfortable under pressure and, and making more putts that, that kind of matter. Um, and, and probably the other big thing for me is, you know, throughout through COVID, I started working with a coach in the UK, Jamie Goff, on top of working with Marcus. Um, and just having eyes on every week, uh, Jamie travels pretty much to every event in Europe. Um, and him and Marcus communicate, and we're both, everyone's on the same page with what we're working on, but having someone there week in, week out, um, I sort of don't stray outside the lines. Um, I think that's made a big difference this year. You know, I haven't turned up to too many tournaments going, well, I'm so far away. I, I, I don't know where my golf game's at, which mm, mm. in probably the, the previous few years, especially during COVID, um, you know, when I, I was doing a lot of it, um, you know, over FaceTime or, or whatever, it was, it, it's just not the same as having someone there eyes on and it's pretty, you know, you feel like you're, trying to figure some of the stuff out yourself. So um, that's made a big difference, I think, in the last sort of year or 18 months. Bringing a second coach on, I can understand where you've come from here because you're a long way from New Zealand for most of the year when you're playing in these tournaments. But also, I suppose, it has the potential for conflict, doesn't it? I think you made the point there also. It's absolutely essential, I suppose, that both coaches um, are singing the same song to you. Yeah, and I, you know, I've made sure that you know they're 
they're in contact. They get they you know they met each other well before um, I started working with Jamie, and I you know they both get along well. Um, and it's both they're both you know cut from the same cloth in terms of golf swing in that regard. And and you know it's it's been been pretty easy. You know I, I can talk about you know anything that I do with Marcus to Jamie, and he understands and he's on the same page and vice versa. So um, it, it kind of works quite nicely now. You know I see Marcus when I'm back home. Um, which you know, I'm probably not home that much now, but you know, I still get the benefit of that. And then you know, there's no pressure on Marcus to travel overseas. Obviously, he's very, very busy, and um, you know, it's hard to get him overseas for a, a decent period of time. And Jamie's, you know, that's his job. He he he's a tour coach. He's got five or six other guys that he works with on tour as well, and just travels around the tournament. So. You know, I can kind of see him for for an hour or so every day, and obviously a bit more if, if needed on tour. And um, it, it's you know so far it's worked really well, and um, hopefully it continues to work that way. What about your driving this year, Ryan? I mean, it's always been one of the strengths of your game, but with the phenomenal distances you hit the ball, uh, inevitably you don't necessarily hit as many fairways as someone who may not hit the ball as hard as you. But in a few tournaments that I've seen, watched you this year, uh, your f- driving was phenomenal at times that you were hardly missing a fairway, yet still getting it out regularly, comfortably over 300 yards. Yeah, I'd, I'd say statistically the driver potentially hasn't been as good this year. Um, you know, we, we had a new driver come in later on the season that took a little bit to get that right, and that's going really, really well now. Um, but I, it, driving's a funny stat now because fairways don't really matter that much. It's just keeping it out of trouble, you know, keep, almost keeping it on your golf hole. And, um, you know, I... I a pitching wedge out of the out of the rough is better than a seven iron out of the out of the fairway. Um, so, well, I imagine that's dependent yeah. on the lie, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it can be some horrible. Well, no, no, I mean, I, 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 statistically, if you go through it, if you break it down, and this is coming from not necessarily from me, but all the stats guys that work on the PJ Tour and shots gained and everything like that, that basically it's hit it down there as far as you can, and the closer you are to the green regardless of your lie, as long as you've got a shot, you're better off than, being, yeah. than laying back in the fairway. What do they, what do they call it? The, so, the, bomb, the bomb and gouge club. Bomb and gouge, yeah, <laughs> to an extent. I mean, you know, Bryson did it at a US Open at Wingfoot a, a couple of years ago. Like it's, you know, it's, So the fairway's hit percentage is not overly important anymore, and my fairway's mm-hmm. hit percentage is probably way down, but in terms of strokes gained off the tee... Um, you know, I'm still going okay, and that's that's probably the more important stat now than than the you know the old traditional, you know, d- driving distance and and um, fairway tip. Have you done anything to improve how far you're hitting the ball, or are you just content with the distances you're getting off the tee now with your driver? No, I've haven't done anything to be honest. I mean, I know some guys chased it either with gym stuff or technology. Um, and I kind of took the theory. Well, I'm already I'm already there. As long as I don't lose it, it's fine. And you know, I certainly haven't lost any over the last couple of years, which is nice. And um, you know, for me, it's more about finding a driver that I feel comfortable with, and I can hit the shots that I want to hit, rather than you know, one that goes you know a bit further, but I lose a bit of control over it. Mm. Uh, you look at someone like Rory McIlroy and a lot of people are mystified as to how far he hits the ball I think he probably technically speaking more often than not might even hit the ball a bit further than you and yet he's uh, of a relatively slim bill compared to some of these guys like uh, the Bryce Sh- the Shambos of this world you played uh, recently somewhere didn't you with Rory McIlroy it was I think up in Dubai at the um, uh, championship final uh, what do you see when he hits the ball what do you what do you notice about his swing um yeah, I mean, it's, it's, he's pretty impressive, obviously, being the world number one. It's And he's got plenty of speed. I mean, he, he uses the ground really well, which is important in golf now. You know, there's the little squat move and push back up off the ground. He's got plenty of speed in his lower body. Um, I think the one thing that Rory does that not many others do, he hits it so high. Um, so he can kind of get away with a driver that doesn't spin that much because it launches really because he launches it quite high and he gets a lot out of it in that sense on top of the speed he generates. So, you know, you watch him drive the ball. It's, you know, say you compare it to a lot of guys that grow up in New Zealand or Australia, for instance, where it's really windy. And ironically, you know, Rory grew up in Northern Ireland where it's supposed to be quite windy, but he hits it probably twice as high as I do off the tee for, for very for very similar speeds, but. 
I think that's just a product of playing in America, and that's his golf swing, and he gets a he gets a lot out of it. You two seem to get on pretty well, judging by the pictures we saw on the television when you were playing together in Dubai a few weeks ago. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Um, no, he's pretty keen on his rugby, so I think he enjoyed winding me up about the uh, <laughs> the series Irish. earlier in the year. And um, actually, there was I was speaking to his coach, and uh, my old man did some coaching, rugby coaching at Rory's school in the late eighties, and there was a photo. Uh, Dad played golf with, with Michael, uh, Rory's coach, as well that day at Hollywood Golf Club, which is where Rory yeah. grew up. Mm, mm. A couple of photos floating around, so it was kind of cool to, to find that out as uh, well. And then I noticed a couple of weeks ago you were playing with um, <laughs> someone from the dark side, Cam Smith. How did you get on with him? I get along great with Cam. I've known Cam since we played amateur golf since he was probably about 15 or, or potentially younger. Um, and, you know... I'm not. I'm not going to criticise his decision. You know, he he seems very happy, and um, you know, obviously he's a he's a major champion. He's won the players' championship. He's, you know, he, he's had a he's had a heck of a career. And if someone offers you that much money, it's pretty hard to turn it down. So, um, but you know, we didn't really talk much about that. To be honest, Cam's a mad king fisherman as as a as a mine. And um, to be honest, we pretty much talked about that in boats for most of the way around. Uh, Brisbane a couple of weeks ago. Uh, let's talk a bit about Live Golf because you're kind of in the middle of all of this. I'm sure there's been and there's been reports that you've been approached informally after the successes you've had this year. Uh, Rory, of course, is very much on the side of the establishment or the US PGA Tour. Um, where is this thing going, uh, Foxy? Can, can you really see any room for a resolution between the two factions? Um, to be honest, I, I really don't know at this point. Um, you know, I, a lot has happened in the last six months that, um, you know, probably that I, I think a lot of people in the establishment are surprised that Liv got, got, Liv got as far as they did. Um, you know, I, from a business perspective, I still, you know, I, there's a lot going on that I don't know about, but, you know, obviously that, you know, they're still bleeding money, so I don't, I don't know what how they overcome that you know at some point they've still got to be profitable and at this point obviously they're not so it's pretty messy and i can't see them sitting down anytime soon it's i think it's pretty hard to sit down with someone that's suing you and obviously there's suits going both mm-hmm. ways at the mm-hmm. moment so and there's some egos involved on both sides um so we'll see what happens i mean in the short term it's been good for golf um in general i think you know, the competition, while the division's not good, you know, the competition has bought in some stuff both on both tours, um, you know, PJ Tour and, and the DP World Tour that wouldn't have happened otherwise. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's an interesting space, but, you know, I, I wouldn't want to even guess what's going to happen over, over the next couple of years. It, it's it's mm. going to be, I imagine there's going to be some pretty messy things go on, but, um, you yeah, know, I guess we'll probably... Middle of next year, you know, when Liv kicks off again and and the PJ Tour is in full swing with their new schedule, we'll probably get a bit better idea of how it's going to sit going forward. Well, I mean, there's this court case that you've referred to, which I think is scheduled for a court uh, in Northern California, I think might be San Francisco, uh, somewhere towards the end of January. If the court rules in favour of uh, Live Golf and says that um, uh, essentially they should get world ranking points and they sh- their players should be allowed to play in the majors, uh, then you have to pose the question, what happens then as far as the um, advocates... So- the, is the advocates of, of the status quo like Rory McIlroy and, and Tiger Woods, what do they do then if the court effectively rules in favour of Live Golf? So by, by all accounts, that court case has nothing to do with the world rankings and nothing to do with the majors. So it's purely against the PJ Tour. So the majors always have sat above, you know, are separate to the PJ Tour. So the majors will make their own decision and I think they will basically sit on the fence um, and, you know, if you've qualified, you're in. Um, that would be my gut feeling. I'm not sure, sh- you know, obviously something could change, but the, with the world ranking situation, there's, you know, less live guys going to play. So I don't think it bothers them too much. Um, the world ranking system is a bit of a mess, I think, at the moment. Um, you know, obviously they've changed the whole system um, in the last couple of months. And, you know, it was, it's gone from probably being a bit skewed towards the other tours worldwide to now being massively skewed towards the PGA Tour. Um, and, you know, there's been quite a few of the top guys, John Rahm, Rory, Tiger, come out and criticise it. 
Mm. Um, I know they've got some kind of meeting um, going on you know, over the next little while um, to maybe tweak some things potentially. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes. But the, the actual court case itself, from what I understand, is whether the live golfers can play on the PJ Tour. So the PJ Tour is enforced a ban on mm. them. Their mm. regulations are very strong compared to the DP World Tour. Um, so it's going to be, uh, and I, you know, that court case could last two years. And by all accounts, it's not due to be heard um, until the end of next year at least. So, um, you know, a lot, a lot can change before that court case is even heard. So but, we'll see what happens. But it's it's a very interesting, interesting uh, time in golf if, if you. You know, kind of objective about it. My understanding that there is a court case in the latter part of January in California uh, around these suits and, and counter suits. So, um, essentially, what it's your understanding that the legal system, the courts, can't compel these owners of the major championships to change their rules of eligibility. No, I don't think so. Um, I very much well, they've been set in stone for a while um, it's the same with the world rankings as far as I'm concerned um, I, I yeah I, I if there is a court case in January about this it's news to me I haven't heard anything about it I know there's a court case going on mm. which is supposed to be late late 23 or early 24 against the PJ Tour which is the really big one mm. um, there is another court case um, for the DP World Tour um, against Liv um, you know, trying to uphold uh, sort of bans and fines that we um, we imposed when they first played, um, and that's due in February. But, yeah, uh, if there is a big one in January about the majors and something else, then it's complete news to me. No, I, I understand it's just a, a further hearing around the, the, the suit that Liv have brought against the PGA Tour and in turn uh, the PGA Tour are counter-suing uh, live for some reason which I, I can't recall and that there's going to be some sort of it might only be an informal hearing between the parties where the judge I think is trying to see if there's any common ground where this thing can be resolved without going to the, a full hearing of the court at some later date but as you say it's messy but I suppose in a curious kind of I don't, way I mean I don't I don't see it I don't see anything being resolved in a hearing yeah. like that to be yeah. honest it's going to get to a point where it's going to have to go to court, court. properly yeah Unless, unless something drastically changes in the next year. Mm. It would seem to be the case. Curiously enough, I suppose that um, what has happened with the arrival of Live Golf is, I think you might have alluded to there, that it has uh, opened up, hasn't it? Um, the DP World Tour and someone like yourself now is able to play, what, maybe up to eight or ten events in America next year. Probably if Live Golf hadn't come along, that might have not been open to you. Um, pretend, uh, not necessarily. So I get the starts from top 50. Mm -hmm. um, so most that that's always been the pathway. That's how guys like Tommy Fleetwood, Tyrrell Hatton, Alex Noren um, have got on the PJ Tour in the past, get themselves in the top 50. There's a bunch of top 50 events that have events that have a top 50 category to play, and you know they'll take anyone from any tour in that regard. But, if you're um, in the top. Is it, isn't there also now a new kind of exemption? category that the USPGA have brought in where if you finish in the top 10 on the race to Dubai on the DP World Tour, that, that gets you into tournaments in America? So that starts next year for the following year. Oh, okay. So um, that's basically, they take, they give out 10 cards, which is a here Corn Ferry Tour um, for the PJ Tour in 2024 from our, from our order of merit. Um, and it slides as well. So it's the top 10 not otherwise exempt. Yeah. So let's, you know, a Rory and a John Rahm finish one and two per se. Um, they've already got a PJ Tour card, so it'll slide two yeah. places. So that's a, it's a useful thing to be in the background for you, isn't it? Well, I basically get two chances at a PJ Tour card next year. I can either play my way on the traditional way through the top 50 events if I play well enough in the majors. Mm -hmm. And if not, um, you know, try to finish somewhere around that top 10 and get... Um, you know, a, a card that way from the um, from the from finishing in the top ten, yeah. Of merit. 
So yeah. if, if that does eventuate, I mean, you have said to me in the past that you kind of like the DP World Tour, the old European tour, because you can get home every weekend to uh, your place in London where you're based when you're up there and it's easy to get around, um, probably a lot less travel, oddly enough, than in America. But if you have the option of getting a tour playing card on the US PGA Tour, it's at the end of next year, would you take it? Definitely. I mean, it's that's where the best players in the world play and. Um, you know, it has always been a dream. I do really enjoy playing in Europe. I don't think I'd give that up. I still try to play both tours, um, which is, can be quite hard. But you know, that would be the main goal going forward to, to you know to get that PJ Tour card um, and then you know be able to play kind of pick and choose my schedule of the best events around the world mm. over a year. Mm. I suppose the other thing is if you were on the US PGA Tour, uh, you, you could m- make probably more trips home, couldn't you? An overnight flight from Los Angeles and you're back in Auckland. Yeah, it's definitely a lot easier to travel back and forth from New Zealand than obviously the two flights from Europe. So that's a nice little benefit, but you know, I'm still a long way away from, from that at the moment. So what events have you definitely got invites for on the US Tour this year, apart from the uh, possibly the majors? Um, well, none at this point, but you know, it's at, at this stage the top fifty events are Bay Hill, the players match play, um, Hilton Head, Memorial, and Colonial. Um, so there's six of the new elevated events on the PJ Tour, and if I'm in the top fifty in the lead up to those events, then I get in the field. So, um, you know, probably got to think I'll be in the top fifty, you know, come March for for Bay Hill and the players in the match play. And then if I play well enough, I should be able to stay in that top 50 and, and you know, get all the majors and get you know, be able to play you know, a full, well, uh, not a full, but a, a good PGA Tour schedule for next year. And these are all now, what, 20 million US uh, dollar prize tournaments, aren't they? The new ones, that, that the ones that you've just mentioned. I think so, the, the elevated events are, yeah. Mm. Wow, boy, things are changing quickly in the world of golf, aren't they? <laughs> and you, you're in the right place at the right time, I think. At the moment, yes, definitely. Mm. Oh, well, Foxy, I thank you very much indeed for your time and uh, it's a pity we won't be able to see you in the uh, New Zealand Open, but I'm sure everyone in New Zealand, golf fans anyway, fully understands that uh, you have far bigger fish to fry and I'm sure John Hart would be the first one to wish you well uh, for wherever you are the week of the New Zealand Open. But I imagine one day you'll come back and play it, won't you? Uh, Definitely. I mean, it's just one of those things for next year. If I am in Bay Hill, obviously that's an opportunity I can't turn down. Um, no, if, if I'm not, I will definitely be playing the New Zealand Open and definitely aim to play the New Zealand Open going forward. So, um, yeah, it's just bad timing for next year, potentially. It's always been an issue for New Zealand golfers. I can think of, you know, the days of uh, Frank Nobolo, Grant Waite and others playing on the US Tour and Craig Perks. They always have this uh, problem. And uh, Danny Lee, I suppose, is another one. Uh, and you've got to put your career first, I suppose, before, um, you know, coming back to New Zealand. But anyway, I'm sure you're going to have a good break. What a bit of fishing and a lot of fishing, I suppose, over the next few weeks. That is the plan if the weather plays ball, which at the moment in Auckland it's definitely not. But, um, yeah, hopefully it settles down and we get a few nice windless days and I can get out on the boat. Mm. And no hitting golf balls for a while? Uh, definitely not. No, my clubs are going in the cupboard and hiding away somewhere. <laughs> when will you bring them out next? I'll play some social golf before Christmas, but I won't start work until probably the second week of January before going to Abu Dhabi. Mm. Good stuff. Anyway, Ryan, have a very happy and enjoyable Christmas, and thank you for your time today. Much appreciated. Cheers, Tal. Thanks for having me. Uh, Ryan Fox uh, with us here today on the platform talking about these really kind of, I suppose, turbulent times in golf. Where is the sport going to? Not even someone like Ryan, who's now very much part of the world's elite. When you're inside the top 30, I think he got as high as 23 a few weeks ago, you are part of the top elite, and he can virtually get into, by the sound of it, every major golf championship and a whole lot of other big events as well. And um, no real idea of what's going to happen to the sport in 2023.